things. Sorry. I'm just going to draw attention to a few key uh, things, a few key developments since uh, last summer, um, so that we can appraise more accurately uh, where we stand uh, now compared to then. So first off, we in the UK will have noticed that since then we've had two new prime ministers. Uh, is this a, a change for, for the better? I think it's worth dwelling on this for a moment. With Boris Johnson, we had a prime minister who talked a good talk when it came to all things green. But the walk that he walked was pretty much completely useless. Some people said to me uh, when um, a number of us were trying to help shoot Boris Johnson uh, out of the door, Rupert, isn't it actually better that we have uh, uh, Johnson in power? Because um, at least he raises green issues up the agenda. And I think it can actually be worse than nothing to have someone uh, like that, someone who is a, a complete uh, liar, who uh, systematically mis misrepresents what they're doing because it gives people some kind of sense of, oh, well, here's someone who at least wants to do something. Uh, it's actually in some ways better to have um, our enemies be red in, in tooth and claw. And that's what we got under Liz Truss. Uh, with Liz Truss, the, the veil was, uh, was stripped uh, away. There was no pretense. Uh, it was going to be an agenda of uh, scrapping everything in the helter-skelter uh, pursuit of any possible more um, economic growth that could be squeezed out of the uh, squeeze out of the system. Uh, do turn your microphone off, please, if it's uh, if it's on. Uh, and uh, well, um, trust in her brief reign actually did rouse some real opposition that hadn't been roused before. Most notably, the old moderate flank got mobilised. I'm talking about people like the World Wildlife Fund, the National Trust, uh, most strikingly of all, the RSPB. Uh, and this is a positive development that we need to um, build on uh, and continue to seed uh, now because these threats have not gone away. Uh, Rishi Sunak, uh, the latest uh, prime minister, uh, is not yeah, as uh, out and out. Uh, do please everyone turn off your, uh, your uh, um, volume. Uh, Rishi Sunak uh, is not an, as out and out destructive as uh, Truss is, uh, but um, there is nothing at all reassuring in uh, what he is doing. It's worth bearing in mind that he is by far the richest uh, prime minister uh, we have ever had. He cut his teeth in the world of um, absolutely profit hungry at all costs, uh, merchant banking and hedge funds. Uh, he is uh, not someone who is at all interested uh, in matters green or ecological. Uh, he is no friend to our agenda uh, at all. Uh, and that is why we are continuing to see, um, well, depraved is quite a good word for it, I think, depraved uh, actions from this government in relation to the matters that concern us and should concern everybody. As Kim says, a majority, I'll come back to that point in a moment. Uh, the most striking recent example has been the decision to go ahead, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and open a new coal mine in this country for the first time in 30 years which it's, I mean, there's nothing one can say. It's just beyond belief, uh, beyond a joke, beyond a farce. Um, that is a, a very clear signal of how we are continuing to fly off the cliff at maximum velocity. Uh, people sometimes uh, say to me things like, oh, oh Rupert, it's, we're in such terrible danger, aren't we? You know, we must be very close to the cliff edge now. And my reply is, no, if you want to use that metaphor, we're already off the cliff edge. We're off the cliff, we're, we're tumbling down, getting damaged as we fall. We have to try to stop our fall. Uh, and then we will have to try, if we ever manage to do that, to start clambering back up the, the cliff again, which is gonna be very, very difficult. So the situation domestically could not be a great deal worse at the macro political level. What about internationally? Well, there, of course, the two key developments since a number of us met in St. Albans last summer are the two COPs that we've had, COP27 uh, in Sharm el-Sheikh uh, and the Biodiversity COP, COP15 uh, in Montreal. So what of those? Well, COP27 was notable for the, the opening of a loss and damage fund. And this is a great success. However, two very important things to note. Firstly, a fund isn't much good unless there's money in it. And there is virtually no money in this loss and damage fund. And there is no sign that there is gonna be very much money in it. 
And secondly, we should be cautious before celebrating too much about a COP whose main achievement was to create a loss and damage fund. Because what a loss and damage fund is, is a way of dealing with the absolute worst consequences of climate breakdown. But when the same COP does nothing to prevent those consequences, when it in fact on balance makes it more likely that those consequences are gonna be worse than they were before, you know, the extraordinary thing about COP27 is that basically what they did is they said quietly, we're going to create worse loss and damage. And then they said very loudly, and we're opening a fund to deal with loss and damage. You see the, the irony of the situation. As for COP15 in Montreal, um, there was huge celebration around this COP. It was said to be the equivalent of the Paris COP, um, the, the, uh, the famous uh, COP uh, seven years ago uh, that um, um, finally put us on the path of having some kind of uh, agreement on what to do about climate. So allegedly Montreal is the same for uh, biodiversity. So two points about that. Firstly, we shouldn't overly celebrate what occurred at Paris. It was an incredible diplomatic achievement. But as we well know, as we've seen in the years since, it has not led to any actual downturn in climate deadly uh, emissions. It is toothless. Uh, it is uh, a path to catastrophe. Uh, much the same is true of the biodiversity uh, COP agreement in Montreal. And I'm actually quite nervous, and I've written about this. You can look it up if you want, if you Google something like um, biodiversity COP15, uh, Rupert Reid. Uh, you'll see what I and my colleague Victor Anderson uh, wrote about uh, this. That there is a grave danger that what happened at Montreal, a sort of paper tiger apparent success, will lead to complacency. And that is the last thing that we need. We ought to be very clear that what was achieved in Montreal, while again diplomatically impressive, is essentially toothless uh, and will be nothing without absolutely vigorous ongoing citizen action from the ground up. So uh, as so often, I'm afraid I'm having to pour quite a lot of cold water on any claims that have been made that, oh, well, look at the wonderful advances we've made over the last uh, year. Um, there have been some advances since we met uh, in St Albans uh, last year. For example, there is increasing um, agitation against the Energy Charter Treaty. If you don't know what the Energy Charter Treaty is, look into it. It's a, a very disturbing treaty that, unlike the COPs, does have teeth. Uh, and it forces uh, governments, basically, uh, to give more or less carte blanche, <coughs> excuse me, uh, to uh, energy companies and to maximize the uh, recovery of fossil fuels. It's an obscure, horrible treaty that should be a lot better known. And, and some countries are starting to move against it, including most lately and encouragingly the EU. The thing which has encouraged me uh, most over the last several months, um, but that's partly because I'm close to it, uh, as Kim uh, signaled, is the rise of the new moderate flank, uh, which I think um, <coughs> goes right alongside, <coughs> excuse me, I've got some kind of issue with my throat, it goes right alongside the, um, the way that the RSPB and others in the old moderate flank have become mobilized finally um, by the um, nefariousness of our current government. And what we're trying to do in this new moderate flank, as Kim said, is to co-create a climate majority. <coughs> that is, to build upon the majority which, according to opinion polls, already exists, showing grave concern around climate and ecology, and turn that into reality, I turn that into activity, into activation, into people on the ground, in their lives, in their extended families, in their workplaces, professions, businesses, in their geographic communities, and so on and so forth, in civic institutions, in religious institutions, moving to create the to create the change from the bottom up, which governments should be giving us, but plainly are not. So in the absence of their leadership, uh, we have to lead. And well, I believe that it is certain that this kind of movement will grow in the coming years. The only question is, will it grow fast enough? Will it grow deep enough? Will it grow wide enough? Uh, will it be well enough resourced? Will it be wise enough? Uh, and of course, in relation to all those questions, that's where you come in. Kim. Yeah, thank you. So um, one of the things that I hear 
over and over again, Rupert, is uh, when people do start to wake up to this is, um, yeah, but what can what can I do? And, and mm. I don't know, um, my uh, my particular focus is supporting people uh, in beginning to answer that question. And we recently put a blog up on the Heart Community Group website, which I put a link to there in the chat. Um, with a kind of some beginnings of an answer about how to find what is yours to do. So do feel free to go and look at that. Um, but yeah, say a bit more about what can people do uh, in the places that they live and the places that they work? Yeah. Well, yeah, firstly, Kim, may I say that, uh, as you're well aware, I'm a big fan of the work that you're doing uh, on this. <coughs> it's a very important um, <coughs> endeavour to... Uh, to get people to look at this uh, um, <coughs> and take it seriously in their own lives. Um, and one way that I encourage people to think about it, <coughs> me, I really have an issue here. I don't know what's going on. Sorry. <clears throat> this doesn't usually happen to me. Um, one way that I encourage people to think about this in their own lives is to ask the question, <coughs> what is my legacy? Uh, what is my legacy going to be? To, <coughs> to look back on your own uh, life um, <coughs> from the perspective of now, <coughs> gosh, or from the imagined perspective of your uh, deathbed and ask yourself, what will I have left behind? And um, that's a question that ultimately none of us can, uh, can avoid. <coughs> You know what, Kim, I'm going to invite you to say a bit more about this because I need to recover my voice. A bit. Yeah, you do. And also, let me ask the rest <laughs> of the group. You can, from now, please, um, start writing uh, questions in the chat. I see some of you already started to do that. So please, just while Rupert is recovering, um, what, are, what questions do you have of Rupert, either about the whole meta crisis, the predicament, and indeed about the new emerging uh, moderate flank and what's actually happening uh, on there. Um, and um, I, I know certainly that from the people that I speak with that there is a real yearning, a growing yearning a longing for more purpose, more meaning uh, in our lives. Um, and um, so I think, I think there is a real hunger to begin to actually take some action. And the difference between, uh, I, I would say there's a distinction between activism, which many uh, non-radical people are kind of um, frightened of, and action. So you don't have to be an activist to take action. How are you doing, Rupert? Well, uh, a little better. Maybe I'll try speaking a bit quieter and see if that... Uh helps me to not start coughing again. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, if people want to dive into this uh, this inquiry around the concept of activism, then it's a, a great idea to look at the work of Bayoa Kamalafi, uh, which is not hard to find now. Um, <clears throat> I have also looked into this in concert with uh, someone who's uh, very keen on the moderate flank, my colleague, uh, Anthea Lawson. Uh, if you Google her and me, you can find our conversations about um, thinking beyond the concept of activism and beyond the bubble which uh, activism sometimes um, exists in. Uh, I think that it is certain that in the 2020s there will be more activism, but I also think it is certain that in the 2020s there will be a lot more action and activation which goes beyond activism, yeah. which, is not, which is not corralled or categorized as um, activism. Um, and I think that that is essential. Uh, we need a, a, a real climate majority to, to act uh, if we are going to um, get through this at all, um, let alone in a way which, uh, which minimizes the, uh, the risk or consequences of collapse as we saw in the, uh, uh, my little video at the start of this uh, yeah. session. Uh, and um, that directly implies uh, that we have to reach out to people way beyond the activist bubble and not just say to them, you should become an activist like me, uh, but try to encourage them to get involved in um, the work that is theirs to do, uh, to use your uh, phrase, uh, Kim. Yeah. Uh, and 
yeah, that's a central task of the uh, of the emerging uh, moderate flank or climate majority, uh, and makes it quite different in its approach to what the radical flank uh, has offered us in the in the last few years. Yeah. Uh, as per um, um, Extinction Rebellion, for example, which I was very proud to have helped launch, and uh, we changed uh, <clears throat> this country and to some extent the world um, permanently, it would seem, uh, in 2019. But what I realized in 2020 is that um, XR is never going to appeal to uh, the majority. And I think XR and uh, the school strikers and so on, they actually did quite a lot of their job in 2019. They raised the alarm uh, in a very effective way. Uh, eventually, one has to move on beyond just raising the alarm. Uh, when the fire alarm goes off, um, sometimes you need to uh, ring it another time uh, and draw attention to the fire a bit more. But eventually the fire brigade has to go in uh, and fire brigades should be run by uh, government. Um, but uh, in the absence of government fire brigades, we need volunteer fire brigades. Uh, and so that's what we are or that's what we need to become. Uh, right. Volunteer fire, brigade, fire brigades all across the piece. Great. Thank you so much, Rupert. Well, I've got one more question, which I'm going to save to the end of time. But for now, let's go to questions from the audience. Um, Annabelle or Jilly? Sure. Thanks, Kim. Um, yeah, looking through, we've got quite a few questions, a lot of them along the same lines, which I think, Rupert, you were just beginning to talk about, which is basically, where do you stand with, you know, this talk of the radical flank and particularly with the big one coming up, which is the Extinction Rebellion event on the 21st of April? How do you see the moderate flank fitting into that? I think there's a lot of questions there. Um, perhaps the last one, I think Ashley, who says, just trying to get a feel for it. Ashley, would you like to unmute and, and ask your question? Yeah, so so I was, uh, hi, I was just trying to get a feel for what is radical and what isn't. Um, I'm actually not a massive activist. I, I, I don't particularly enjoy campaigning. I, I do it every now and then. Um, but I know that XR this year have sort of said we're going to have a less antagonistic approach. We, you know, we're not going to go away. But um, we, we, so April the 21st, they've got the big do in London, but they want it to be very peaceful and just, uh, you know, everyone to turn up to show they care that's my understanding of it is that radical or is that not radical is that is that you know what, what what where does that sit in the scheme of things and is that a really stupid question to ask in the first place i don't know <laughs> no i think that's a, a really good question and uh i think the reason you're asking the question is because it's not so obvious how to categorize what xr are now doing and the reason why that's the case is because they have a new strategy and it's a more moderate strategy. Um, so in other words, XR, which was defining of the new um, radical flank uh, when, it was when it was created, you know, when we created XR in 2018, it was deliberately intended, absolutely deliberately, explicitly intended in terms of social movement theory as a radical flank to the existing environmental movement. That is, for example, why one of XR's earliest actions was the controversial eye-catching, eyebrow-raising uh, occupation of Greenpeace HQ to, to make the point, um, uh, we are gonna be more radical than, than thou, as it were. Um, but the new strategy uh, is decidedly moving in a more moderate direction. It's, it's seeking to be uh, more um, genuinely and deliberately uh, inclusive, uh, and it is um, abjuring um, disruptive protest against, as it were, the public. Uh, so uh, in that sense, um, I welcome it. I welcome this new strategy on XR's part. Um, I think this new strategy on their part is, if you will, a sort of um, positive gesture in the direction um, of the new uh, moderate flank. Um, and I've put in the chat for those interested the statement that we uh, made uh, in response to XR's new uh, strategy uh, in the link there. Um, so, yeah, I welcome it. Um, uh, I will probably be there uh, myself, um, and I'm sure many others who are, who are uh, not in favour of um, um, further protests that disrupt the public will be there um, with XR on April the 21st. However, that's not quite the same thing as saying that I think that 
the April the 21st gambit is particularly likely to really succeed, uh, nor that it is enough. Um, will it succeed? You know, I hope it succeeds. And that's why I'll probably be there uh, myself. Um, and uh, we need um, <laughs> the kinds of changes that uh, virtually everyone in this call and XR are, uh, have in mind uh, and, are, and are calling for. Uh, but I think that XR need to be a little bit careful with their rhetoric around this. They're calling it the big one and they're saying, oh, you know, we can change history through this. Uh, even if XR get 100,000 people in total to come out um, with this new, more moderate um, stance, which is a huge ask, um, I don't think that will change uh, history. I, I don't think it's likely to have as much of an effect, for example, as the April Rebellion in 2019 had, which really was game changing for public consciousness. Um, so I think XR need to be careful not to, to sort of over promise here. Uh, furthermore, um, as I say, um, I don't think it, it's enough to do the kind of thing that XR plans to do on April the 21st. We need to effect um, transformation uh, where we live, where we work etc. People are hungry for this. Kim was getting at this earlier. People really want to know uh, what to do. And what most people mean by that is how do they make a positive difference? Uh, people are, uh, most people are not satisfied to just protest or raise the alarm. Um, they're impatient um, with just that approach. Uh, and they want to get on and do stuff um, themselves. So what does that mean? It means things like community climate action. It means engaging in um, transformative and also uh, deep adaptation. Uh, it means things like um, trying to get uh, your neighborhood or perhaps your extended family to actually start to make what changes uh, can be made in their lives, what changes we can make um, uh, together uh, that start to add up to something. It means making changes where we work. Um, Lawyers for Net Zero is one very interesting new moderate flank organization uh, trying to get the law to, um, to act on uh, companies uh, to, to clean up uh, their act. Um, uh, in the field of marketing, you have uh, people like um, purpose disruptors and clean creatives who are trying to turn the, the dark arts into something good into something positive. There need to be sim there needs to be similar initiatives and to some extent there are uh, in other key areas such as insurance or audit. Um, but we can go way beyond this. It, it ought to affect also how people do farming, how people how how we engage in transportation. Now a lot of this obviously um, ultimately uh, requires um, involvement from government to complete a transformation. But the point is we can't hang around and wait for government and we can't just kind of carry on demanding things of government. We've been demanding things of government for years and that actually hasn't got us very far in terms of actually getting the demands answered. So it's about trying to create change through uh, businesses, through workplaces, through institutions, through neighborhoods and communities to the best extent that we can uh, and starting to get momentum uh, and starting to um, put pressure on uh, and ultimately shame uh, governments and major institutions into catching up with where the people already are and are moving. That's the kind of thing that uh, we're urging people to do when we're urging people to become an active part of the climate majority. And what everybody needs to figure out, as Kim was saying before, is what is my most effective way of, of doing this? Where do I have the most uh, uh, leverage. For some people, it might be through their money. Uh, for other people, it might be through um, their um, uh, community, the, the network they have in their local community. For other people, it will be at their um, workplace. For some, it will be at, at more than one of these places. But what you, what you really want to be asking yourself is, if you're not already doing it to the maximum extent possible, so you can really leave the legacy you, you want to. Where is the place in my life where I have the most leverage to start to actually exercise and implement uh, positive change along with others? That's the kind of question that uh, I'm asking people to ask themselves. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Ashley and Rupert. Okay, next question. Um, Annabelle? Hmm. 
Well, uh, I'll um, facilitate this. Uh, Kathy has made a very interesting uh, question, which links also to an earlier comment uh, by Anna. So, Kathy, I wonder if you'd like to speak about what you've um, written in the chat and ask Richard. Is Kathy there? Yes. Oh, hi. Um, well, um, I've done the course with Kim on, you know, what is it ours to do? And it took a lot of thinking th through, you know, it's not just a brain activity, it's, it's a whole reflection on one's being really. And what I, I've come away with was how long it has taken me to move away from my fear. And so doing lo you know, something locally, like the other day I was um, gardening and, and somebody did actually ask, my garden hasn't got any fence around it at the front. And somebody just you know, made a comment about the weather. So I just you know, extended the comment a little bit and asked them, what did they mean by that? And we just had a short conversation about climate change. And she went away with her dog. Um, and I, I, I wouldn't necessarily put that as a, you know, a report on, on um, Moderate Flank's website, the way I was advocating, but um, like Anna has said that she set up a Moderate Flank group in her area. And I, I, th I think the small things that we do, be it conversation to move people out of their fear or to educate, or actions like setting up a local group or you know, setting up a repair cafe or whatever, if we listed those on um, a website, then people who are beginning to move away from their fear and think, well, you know, what, what can I do? Um, they could read that and they could say, oh, I could do that. Or, oh, what is that? Maybe I should find out more about that. And we could seed things faster and help people be transformed in themselves to become more empowered by having, not only to get through their own fear, but, but to, to have help from other people with ideas about what the art of the possible. And we all need to start small. You know, we're not gonna become Gandhi overnight or anything, but um, if we all start small and, and find that there is a website like this one, you know, with lots and lots of ideas on it, then we don't feel alone anymore. And that helps us stand up and walk away from our fear. So that's, that was all I was thinking, a list of actions and um, that people have done that people could copy. Thank Great. you, Kathy. yeah, Rupert. Yeah, well, uh, look, Kathy, I couldn't agree more. I think that that's fabulous. Talking about it is so important. It's a small thing, but it can become a big thing and it, it can become infectious. Uh, not observing the uh, taboo around discussion of some of this, which is breaking, but which there's still some of. This is what you were referencing when you talked about your fear, which is an interesting expression I'll, I'll come back to. Talking about it is so, so important. You mentioned repair cafes, brilliant. You mentioned creating local groups. Yeah, obviously super important. And these local groups try to make them uh, as inclusive as possible, mm. as genuinely inclusive as possible. What I mean by that is try to, in a certain sense, mainstream them without, without dialing back on any of the urgency, without dialing back on any of the truthfulness. See how much you can include people who are from different class backgrounds, people who are not necessarily from the same political orientation uh, as yourself. You know, that's the really exciting potentiality that hasn't been fully explored yet. Can we do inclusive semi-mainstream uh, local groups which are really serious about change and transformation? And all of these things, all of these things, right, foster a growing sense that change is happening mm -hmm. and that transformation is coming or at least is, uh, is possible. And believe you me, it is possible. And in fact, it's certain. The only question is what kind of transformation is going to come? Is it going to be a good kind or a not so good kind? Uh, or indeed, as is most likely, um, both. Um, and that kind of sense, this is what in the, um, uh, in the new moderate flank we call the our fourth pillar or fourth strand 
the strand which uh, which is to do with what's called now a sense making making sense of the situation making sense of the situation that we're in which is one that is bound to see a growing level of this kind of responsiveness and the more people understand themselves to be part of something which is happening more and more and which is to some extent inevitable the more encouraged they will be the more heart uh, they will have for the struggle and mentioning heart takes us back to this fascinating expression you use kathy which is my fear and of course what you meant by your fear was your fear of somehow uh, being different or of being um, attacked for standing up and talking about something or for telling the truth about the situation. And isn't it interesting that that these fears, um, and I think you're right, I think this kind of fear holds almost all of us back to some extent, almost all of the time. But of course, there's something else that we need to fear, which is what's coming if we don't do that, right? Uh, uh, the, the thing that we really need to fear, the thing we really need to be anxious about is this vast, um, devastating um, tidal wave, if you will, or storm, which has started to engulf us. And so the real question in a way is, you know, which of these fears is going to win out? Are, are we going to be, uh, are we going to go with our emotions around the actual situation, the fear, the grief, the uh, anger, also the excitement, uh, the love that underlies it all? Or is the fear that's going to be most important to us, the fear of um, being attacked, of being different, of uh, wasting our time, of not um, uh, uh, being regarded as normal, et cetera. And when you put those two fears side by side, you know, it's pretty clear which one is more important, right? Is it more important to face the great challenge of our age and the greatest challenge that human beings have ever faced? Or is it more important to be to uh, attend to and be uh, nervous of um, things like uh, will my neighbour tut tut if I start talking about climate? Um, so hopefully, when one sees it, when one starts to see it as clearly as that, when one sees one's fear on the on the on the one hand holding one back, and then the the vast kind of subterranean but emerging fear and anxiety and and grief and terror and so on on the other hand about the actual situation. That's the one to that's the one to go with. That's the one to really uh, attend to uh, and take seriously. And when we do, then we will do exactly the kind of things you were talking about, Kathy. We will talk about it. We will get serious about institutions like repair cafes. We will create really effective, unafraid, if you will, courageous uh, local groups. We will become part of this uh, of this absolutely essential uh, and epochal transformation. Um, which is at, at best going to potentially going to save us from collapse and at least is going to give us some kind of compass as we uh, try to go through the very challenging times that are coming. Brilliant. Thanks, Rupert. Kathy, you had your hand up. Is it a quick one? Because we well, have I, other I questions. Just, thank you, Kim. I, I just wanted to say um, I agree with everything that Rupert said, but, um, you know, the, a small interchange of dialogue does does not have to be um threatening i've discovered yeah, you no, know, you, you, no right. i know i know you know that Absolutely. rupert but mm. you know i mean my, my thought was you know if i don't know the right facts or whatever and like um but actually just a tiny interaction of the like the lady with the dog and you know, talking to me in my garden i have yes. no idea how that's going to seed in her she might mm. ignore it yeah. or she might it might seed into something else and and i just feel that um to get over fear is 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 transformation in its own right you know second by Very second true. and and we need to do it compassionately for ourselves as well as for other, everybody else we interact with oh right. beautifully put so, thank you yeah and i think sorry, I what's just... what's so crucial about what you've just said is that um if one does feel a bit of that fear and we and we all feel it you know might you might think something like uh oh you know rupert reed he's gone on all these tv shows he does all these speeches all the time you know He's obviously overcome his fear. Not at all. Nobody overcomes their fear of these kinds of things except psychopaths. What one <laughs> learns is, is not to be afraid of one's fear, but to make uh, friends with it. And what one learns is that there are things that are more important uh, than it. And what one learns is how to, as you say, Kathy, go sort of one step at a time. So if you are feeling kind of afraid, nervous, and, you know, what is my neighbour going to think? Well, you know, just have a little go and maybe do it in a relatively kind of safe way in a relatively safe situation to a relatively limited extent and what you'll nearly always find is actually things don't work out nearly as badly as you yes. feared 
<laughs> and that encouraged you to go a little bit further the next time and so on. Great, thank, thank, you. thank you. Okay, Annabelle, Jilly, next question. Um, I see, Kate, would you like to ask your question about um, which organisations to network with? Yeah, sure, sorry, something's going wrong with my video. It's um, weird there. Yeah, so obviously we, you talk um, a lot about big um, organisations like Lawyers for Net Zero and things like that. So kind of the other end of the scale of what we can do in our communities and our workplaces if we're not working for big national companies. So are there any kind of industries, organisations that you, you, know, you really want to get into, you'd really like to see them coming out um, in, in favour of the new moderate flank? Who's going to have the most impact in your view? And, you know, then we can try and sort of network and everyone do their bit for that. Well, I can talk, I can answer that question and I, and I will say something in response to that question, uh, for which many thanks, Kate. But look, I do want to start by just sort of turning it around a bit and say, um, this is not just about sort of um, where objectively that are the most important places uh, for change to occur. It also starts from the other end of where are you and where do you have capability or capacity to change? Um, so, and, and you, if you're someone who doesn't work, then obviously you're not going to try to change things through your workplace. Uh, and if you're somebody who works in a situation, I don't know, maybe you're in a, a call center or something where you find it very hard to see how you could get any leverage to make any change. Well, you know, fair enough, you know, maybe you'd be better off spending your time on, say, um, action uh, in the local community to make uh, uh, change. Um, but, you know, many people uh, have some kind of capacity, I believe to affect change through where they work. So let me give one or two uh, examples. Um, uh, teachers, um, uh, I think, uh, obviously um, have a, a kind of position of, uh, of power, which needs to be used very kind of judiciously and responsibly. And of course, there are all sorts of uh, constraints on it, but there are all sorts of possibilities also. Uh, I'm just remembering back to my childhood. I remember one or two uh, teachers who, very much uh, encouraged me to develop uh, an ecological sensibility where most others perhaps didn't. Um, and you know, that kind of thing is a place to start. Uh, I work part-time uh, in a university as an academic. Um, there is enormous capacity and potential for academics to really organize themselves. And as academics, as researchers, as teachers, as to some extent role models, uh, really make a difference and most and it hasn't really been done yet there's that's a huge missing opportunity there um kind of coming more directly to what you were getting at i think in your question about where are the biggest opportunities of all well i'll mention a couple other kind of areas where i'm starting to work with people that i'm quite excited about so uh i've been speaking recently to one or two people from the acting world uh and i think that there is a, a huge responsibility uh, and opportunity for anyone involved in the creative arts. Um, the, the greatest opportunity is this is a story that needs to be told. And that's, of course, what I was trying to do in my little video that we watched at the start of this session, uh, Out of the Ashes, uh, is, to, is to, in a microscopic way, uh, tell that story of the different possible futures that are opening up before us. And different versions of that need to be done again and again and again now. Uh, in film, on radio, in TV, uh, in music, et cetera. And it's hardly been tried yet. There have been some endeavors in literature and in film, virtually none in TV, which is really a shameful uh, abnegation. Of I'm, seeing more in, I'm seeing more in music actually, just recently. Yeah, it's coming through uh, It's coming through in some interesting ways in music. I'd agree with, with that. And this is clearly a coming trend. But anyone who has any involvement or, or leverage in that field, I would urge you, you know, do anything you can to, to make movement happen further and faster in that field. Tomorrow, I'm meeting from um, the uh, I'm meeting with someone uh, in the in the healthcare field who is trying to green um, the, the healthcare professions. These kind of moderate flank um, endeavors are springing up all over the place. Uh, we are supporting some directly through the moderate flank incubator. But part of what we're saying is, look, this is happening already and it's happening all over the place and it's happening spontaneously. And that's really exciting. So what needs to be done is people need to find their place in it 
uh, lend their weight to it, uh, however, whatever form that takes, as I say, it could be time, money, uh, whatever, but it needs to be significant. Uh, and, uh, and where um, what is possible and, and what is necessary is not happening, is not being organized yet, you know, you should do it yourselves. In other words, if there's, if say you're, um, say you're, um, you know, if, say you're a lawyer, you know, you may think, oh, well, I'll join Lawyers for Net Zero and I'll, I'll do it through that, through there. But if in your profession or whatever it is, there isn't something like that, then consider being the person who makes it happen. You know, that would be, that's a really amazing intervention. If you can actually organize or create or co-create something which then starts to really become something that, that works virally or works at scale. Great. Great, thanks. Thank you just, very much. And sorry, sorry, Kate. I'm just loving what's coming out in football at the moment with Reading. And mm, yes. Really, really good to see. Yeah, the situation of football is uh, improving, although obviously there's a very long way to go. Um, the New Zealand woman footballer, um, Katie Rood, um, is a, a nice role model in this area more generally. Uh, the Champions for Earth group is a, uh, a kind of moderate flank group which has emerged in uh, in sport, which is quite exciting. Check them out. And the recent uh, podcast that I did with them and with Manda Scott uh, is quite interesting uh, in this regard. You know, it's happening all over the place. Uh, and what we need to do is to find our place in it and recognise that, that this is a powerful reason for a kind of active hope the fact that it is happening all over the place and that it's growing uh, and that uh, and that there is room here for everybody to make a real and significant difference. Brilliant. Thanks, Rupert. I'm going to choose the last question because um, it's a doozy uh, and it's from Ed, Ed Jarvis. Ed, do you want to unmute yourself and, and ask your question that you wrote? Yeah, sure. So I've asked a few questions. <laughs> Um, so I'm really loving this. Uh, thank you so much, Rupert, for this and, and for Kimberly and the team for putting this on. This is fascinating stuff, yeah. So I don't know, in my mind, we've got like a bit of an arrowhead. We've got all the JSO, XR, IB activists that are arrestable right at the tip of that arrowhead causing, you know, disruption. And some of us may or may not agree with what they're doing, but they are having some kind of impact. There's a number of people supporting them in those organizations who perhaps aren't arrestable. And then behind that, there's not much, there's not a huge amount going on. And this is where I think moderate flank comes in because it's mm -hmm. about mobilizing all those people who don't want to put a D-lock on or get glued on or all the rest of it. It's the, it's the people who don't want to get involved in criminal activity. It gives them an opportunity to get involved and get mobilized. And I suppose my question is that, We've got we've got um, a whole world of micro things that we can get on with. And I don't mean to use the word micro in a disparaging way whatsoever. Some of the stuff that we've heard about today has been absolutely awesome. And we need to do it. And it is empowering and it does keep, give people a sense that they are doing something. But there are some things that are just out of our control, like fossil fuel licenses, for example. We've got we've got a government that's hell bent on digging back into the ground to get energy rather than thinking about all the alternatives. So my, I guess my question is, how do we capture the energy that comes from the moderate flank to do all those wonderful things in our workplace and locally and, and in our regions and support, even if we don't necessarily want to glue on or get de-locked onto anything, how do we work with that radical flank to impact the really big pieces of carbon and greenhouse gas emissions that we've got to reduce? So the fossil fuel licenses in particular, the 26 million pounds of road building, the, uh, the HS2s, you know, and changing the government's mindset, because we've got a mindset issue right in the centre of government, right in the centre of our establishment. How do we work together to get to that outcome? Mm. Fascinating. Thank you. Huge and complex question. You know, I could, uh, you took a long time asking it, but I could take way, way longer answering it, uh, which I don't exactly have uh, have time for. But so let me let me do my best in uh, in, in a succinct way. So look, this really comes down to what one's theory of change is. And nobody knows for sure uh, which theory of change uh, is correct. But there are things that we can say and things that we can uh, learn. And it is so important that we learn, uh, that we learn from things that go right uh, and that we learn from things that go wrong and that we recognize that when things go right and we want to learn from them, 
doesn't necessarily mean we can just repeat them. So, for example, um, it was clear that what XR did in April 2019 uh, basically worked, and that's something to learn from. However, what XR did after April 2019, to some extent, was simply try to repeat what it had already done. Um, I made the argument that XR should segue more towards targeting some of the root causes. Um, so um, uh, the oil industry, big finance, um, uh, airports used by elites, uh, etc. Uh, my argument had some effect within XR, but only uh, some. Um, and one of the reasons why XR has made the strategy shift that it has now made, it is, is that it has come belatedly to recognize that being perceived as uh, targeting the public um, stops working after a while, and in fact is counterproductive. And that is important to say. Uh, and um, I think that it's pretty clear that most of what Insulate Britain did was counterproductive, and people need to learn from that. Uh, it is not true to say that all publicity is good publicity. It is not true. Most publicity is good publicity, but not all. Uh, there are ways you can get publicity which actually are counterproductive for your cause. Uh, and this has been shown in recent um, studies. Um, um, for example, if you look through my recent Twitter, you can find uh, a reference to one such uh, study. So it's about trying to home in on a theory of change um, that works. Uh, and our judgment in the, uh, the new moderate flank, as we try to co-create a climate majority, um, is that what is needed most of all now is the kind of things we've been talking about on this call, uh, which you called in the main ed, uh, micro interventions. Um, and the point is, you're right, that um, the things we've talked about on this call, while significant, will never by themselves be enough. So what's the additional element? So here's where our theory of change gets a bit more um, ambitious. What we believe is that all of this stuff that we're trying to do in the emerging moderate flank, um, the end game of it is cultural transformation. And in fact, civilizational uh, transformationalness. Uh um, what do we think is the vector of that? Well, here's quite a bold way to describe it. Um, Let's take the, the situation of, uh, of government, politics, and elections. We have in power a really terrible um, anti-ecological uh, government, as we started out saying at the start of this call. What are the prospects for replacing that government with a, a better uh, government? Well, they're not great, because although it is virtually certain now that this government will be thrown out with extreme prejudice uh, within the next two years, uh, and the probability is that the next prime minister will be Keir Starmer. Um, Labour have said some good things about, for example, um, stopping new oil, but Labour's programme, uh, if it came in as it stands, would absolutely by no means be enough to put us on the path that is necessary. Um, it might be a bit better if Labour had to govern alongside others. Um, the SNP, the Lib Dems, and especially the Greens, uh, if they were, um, uh, part of uh, a, a ruling majority of MPs uh, might improve things somewhat, but it still wouldn't be enough. Ultimately, we need a new political class. How do you get a new political class? Well, you either get it by revolution uh, or you get it by having um, uh, an electorate that decides very differently from our current electorate. Uh, we judge that the chances of revolution are at present extremely low. So if we think about um, um, the relevance of uh, electoral considerations. And obviously, as I say, we're not just talking about the next election. We have to be thinking about a more uh, medium term uh, strategy and ultimately a long term strategy. People sometimes say to me, yes, but we don't have time. And you're right, we don't have time, but we also don't have a better idea. So we have to get honest. This is a marathon, not a sprint. There are going to be horrible consequences along the way. That is part of the truth that needs to be told. So ultimately, to get a new political class, a really appropriate way to put it is we need a new electorate. Now, what does that mean? I mean, that sounds like a kind of a joke. What it means is the electorate has to be transformed. Who are the electorate? Well, they're us, right? The citizenry have to be transformed. How do we transform the citizenry? Well, we believe that we transform the citizenry by doing exactly the kind of things that we've been speaking about, right? By having all these kind of micro 
um, interventions and changes and endeavors that ultimately will start to add up to something that works on a meso level and on a, on, on a macro uh, level. So ultimately, if we're gonna get where we need to get, we need a new electorate and we're gonna get a new electorate by doing things differently uh, in our um, communities and our, our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, our professions, our other institutions. And we're gonna gradually change, uh, change ourselves by doing in such a way that eventually, uh, among other things, people will vote uh, and act politically uh, quite differently. That's our theory of change. Uh, and we think that it is uh, a theory which is now more realistic than the theories which are typically used uh, among the radical flank or among the old uh, moderate flank, which does not have such bold uh, theories of change at all. Um, so I hope that answers your question. And I hope that's uh, an encouraging way to uh, and an exciting uh, prospect. That's what it's ultimately about, uh, macro uh, scale change, but we don't get there in one, one fell swoop. We have to get there um, by, a, by a slower, um, more genuinely transformational route. Fantastic. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Rupert. And uh, we've run right out of time. Um, there are a lot more questions. Uh, what I will do um, after this call is I will share all the links that we've shared in the chat. Um, and, um, and if there are any other questions, um, Rupert, I hope you don't mind. I will, um, yeah, send you, send you the, the other questions. Yes, Rupert. Yeah, I'm happy to happy with that. I'll do what I can. Can I make one final remark, Kim? Yes, please. Uh, so I just want to leave you with the thought that, you know, I've given you that kind of bold vision. I want to leave you with the thought that um, I started off with a long time ago of legacy. Um, do repeatedly ask yourself the question, what am I going to say when my children or nephews or nieces or whatever look me in the eye in 20 years time and say, what did you do when there was still time to make a really significant difference to the trajectory of where we're at now. You've got to have a good answer to that question. Uh, if, if the answer to that question you give is the kind of thing we've been talking about on this call, great. If you've got a better one, great. You've got to have an answer to that question. It, it, is, a, it is unavoidable. Fantastic. Well, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you especially to Rupert. Um, yeah, and looking forward to how the moderate flank uh, develops and transforms us all. Um, but thank you so much for coming and uh, have a look at the other events coming up uh, on the Heart Community Group website, but really appreciate everybody's time and love. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, folks. Thank you so much, Rupert. Let me stop recording.